As for our speakers, we have Noreen Kazi, who is the Vice President at Turner, and Brittany Tatnall, who is the Manager of Proprietary Applications at American Express. And so a little bit about them. Noreen is a Vice President at Turner, an integrated communications agency specializing in travel and lifestyle brands. She leads the agency's bilingual Miami team, as well as the Travel Trade Division and co-chairs the agency's DEI committee. As an executive leader at the firm, Noreen is responsible for guiding strategic planning and development of key client programs and integrated campaigns. Her work has led to award-winning campaigns for a variety of hospitality brands, in addition to short and long-haul destinations. Noreen sits on the board of the Millennials in Travel, is a member of USTOA's Associate Member Advisory Committee, and is on the steering committee for the organization's DMO Forum. As part of her personal passion for the industry, Noreen is a founding member of EMI Ecuador, a newly launched collaborative that prioritizes pathways to visibility for indigenous communities, artisans, and artists amongst travelers, travel advisors, and travel providers. As it expands into other countries, the initiative offers micro entrepreneurs in emerging tourism destinations, opportunities for mentorship, as well as the tools needed to succeed as part of the tourism equation. Noreen has a bachelor's in journalism and mass communications with a minor in leadership studies from Kansas State University, was born and raised in Mexico City. And this part is, I'm super intrigued and is fluent in six languages. Um, not to say that all the other pieces were not impressive. Um, and Brittany. Brittany has been at American Express for almost three years and has grown with the digital applications team since her first day. In her previous role, she supported and led the strategy and optimization efforts for the prop partner and corporate app experiences. She also managed the team's reporting, building out a, sorry, building out a reporting structure and report that did not previously exist for the team. She has worked across teams and business units to support the launch um, of the most important projects to date. Prior to joining American Express, Brittany worked at Betterment as a chief of staff and EA and at Hearst Magazine. Oh, sorry, and Hearst Magazines as a sales and marketing coordinator. Brittany lives in Brooklyn where she enjoys cooking, supporting local and small businesses and restaurants, grocery shopping, at home karaoke for one, and dreaming of her yacht in Italy. I too aspire to own a yacht. Um, she is an avid believer in being your own number one fan. So if you're hearing this for the, fo for the first time, um, or so, so it, sorry. So if you're hearing this right now, say one nice thing about yourself to yourself. <laughs> really excited to have you, uh, Deandra, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Lakimja. I'm excited to be here with you all tonight and really kick off such a robust discussion among two powerhouses. And I definitely think it will be especially interesting having the perspective of Noreen, who comes from behind the scenes, but also in front of the camera a little bit, as we can see tonight. And Brittany, whose goal is really to push forward herself as a thought leader. I'm glad to have you both here to provide a really well-rounded perspective on a topic that a lot of people, I don't think they really understand quite what it is, or if they do, they don't understand quite how to jumpstart themselves into becoming someone that others look to as a credible expert. So thank you so much, ladies, for giving us your plat your voices tonight. And thank you so much, Lakim Jen, the rest of the New York Urban League young professionals for giving us this chance to have such a fun conversation. Well, at least fun to me anyway. So I hope you guys enjoy it. <laughs> And with that being said, I'm going to kick it right off and dive right in. I hope you all don't mind. Um, so Noreen and Brittany, what do you want people to think of when they hear your name? Brittany, you can go first if you'd like. Yeah, I'm happy to. Thank you okay. very much. I'm happy to be here. Deandra, thank you for hosting. I'm excited to be here with you all this evening. 
Um, when I think of what I want people to think about or what I like to hear when I think about my brand, the number one word for me is always collaborator. I'm a natural born collaborator and connector. I enjoy connecting people to things, things to people, people to people, whatever the case may be. Um, so connector, collaborator, uh, energetic, passionate, and forward thinking. Awesome. It's so no, no, go. I was just about to say, kick it off, Noreen, please. Awesome. Yeah, no, no. Thank you all for, for letting me be part of today's group. I'm so excited to share uh, kind of my experiences and thoughts on thought leadership. Um, as you guys heard, I'm a, I studied thought leadership studies in school. And so uh, it's definitely a topic. The topic of leadership is something that I'm super passionate about. Um, in terms of what I would want people to hear or think of when they hear my name, um, I think it's one is cultured um, and a connector. I think everything that I do is rooted in passion and impact. And so um, I think that when people think of me, I want them to think of me as a person that not only knows to be a good leader, knows when it's okay to sit back and follow and grow others through mentorship or giving them access to new tools to be successful. And then ultimately, um, not only be uh, what my parents named me as, which my dad developed a variety of wheat. So to my dad, I'm just wheat um, that I was named after, but my mother, I'm new light. So uh, I like to say that I bring light into everything that I do uh, through passion and impact. Thank you, ladies. That was amazing. I mean, Brittany. We just met, but I'm already feeling that energy. And Noreen, I've been fortunate to work with you for a little bit. So I know that that I already know the new light is real. The weed is fun, but new light is really the key. So <laughs> glad to be here with such um, dynamic women right now as a woman myself. Um, and now to kind of get into the beginning, just that was a little icebreaker, a little teaser to let you all know a little bit more about the lovely ladies I'm here with tonight. And now to get kind of into the meat of the issue. When you hear the words thought leader, what comes to mind? I think it's someone that can come up, come up with an idea and that can express it through various platforms. Um, you don't have to be super well known to be a thought leader. Um, you could be a thought leader in your community, so long as you have a very clear understanding of what your idea and passion is. Um, that I believe um, is what comes to mind. It's just somebody that can translate an idea into words in a very clear and concise way. I love that. And Noreen, I love that you mentioned you don't have to spend a lot of time uh, in something. You don't have to have a whole years of experience in something to become a thought leader. Uh, and I think that's one of the, the first things that I think about as well. Um, you know, really just highlighting, again, some of the things that Noreen mentioned, but also like someone who takes the time to study what it is that they're passionate about, right? Like it's one thing to be working in it and to do the job. You know, we all go to work every day. We show up to do the job. But who goes, you know, who takes the time to figure out what competitors are doing, what others in the industry, what people outside of the industry are doing, um, and really to figure out ways in which you can expand upon whatever it is you have come to uh, or, or working towards making yourself be the thought leader of. So it's all those passions and that time and dedication. It's the research as well. Um, and it's also putting yourself out there. Nobody's going to know you're a thought leader if you don't speak up in meetings, you don't take fine spaces within the meetings that you already have or the organizations that you sit in to um, speak up, present on what it is that you're working on or what you're passionate about. Wow, y'all are coming in very heavy to start off this. Panel. <laughs> you pretty much answered like three of my later questions just in your intro. Um, so I'm very excited to kind of just keep talking to you all because I think we're going to get some real tangible gems from this call, not just general advice. I'm hoping really we can dive into like actionable things that the um, Urban League members present on this phone call can activate on. And with that being said, I think the next thing that I would love to really touch on is, um, I think a lot, this is the managing your personal brand series. And I think a lot of times people don't necessarily understand um, what the difference is between a personal brand and being a thought leader. So I would love to hear your perspectives on um, how exactly does someone's personal brand support thought leadership? And maybe even when discussing that, dive in a little bit deeper into like what exactly it means to be a thought leader. He's like, I, you know what? We've been on this call for less than like 10 minutes and I'm already, <laughs> I got the girl. Um, I will take the first 
part of that. And I will say that opportunities to become a thought leader to me are twofold. It's what you are have defined for yourself that you're passionate about and that you work towards. And it's what the people who work around you, your colleagues, your direct reports, your leaders see that you have the ability to really um, shine in. Uh, but in order for your leaders to be able to identify that about you, um, you have to have a part of that as your personal brand, right? Like, I don't, I'm, if you're a thought leader in marketing and someone says like, oh, what do you think about when you think of Brittany? Like, oh, I, she's a marketer. Like, I, you know, n- not really, right? But like your leader could say, oh, okay, when you give, when I give Brittany a task, she follows through completely. And she doesn't just bring me the answer. She brings me who she spoke to to get the answer, what several people, several different people told her. Um, When this project comes up, that's a big company project or something that I know she's expressed that she's she's passionate about, I'm going to bring her on and I'm going to let her uh, try herself out and help her to grow her, um, help to grow her in that sense. Um, So it's really a mix of, again, it's like taking up, for someone in the chat said, taking up space um, and, and putting yourself out there and making sure that each touch point of your brand represents you. So like an Apple store, I love giving this example. You're never going to walk in an Apple store and see a steel table. Like you're never going to, you're never going to walk in an Apple store and see a foldable cookout chair. Like, yeah, come, come hang with us today. Like we're chilling at Apple. No, you're always going to see a wood. It's never going to be a red wood. It's never going to be a cherry wood. It's always going to be that light wood. Those could be white and bright in that space because they have an idea and they have an idea of their brand that they want to follow all the way through to that touch point of the store. So your personal brand is your touch point, right? Like, and so you, every person that interacts with you should be able to say the same or similar things about your brand. And that's how you get the access uh, to projects and to opportunities that lead you to become even more of a thought leader. Thank you, Brittany. I love that Apple example because I think all of us have spent way too much time in the Apple store. <laughs> but Noreen, as um, someone who works in the PR and marketing industry, really positioning executives to take advantage of thought leadership opportunities, I would love to hear your perspective on like the relationship between the personal brand and thought leadership. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I touched on this briefly, but I, I think there's an interconnectedness there um, and an intersection between Um, your personal passions and values, or in my scenario, the passion and values of an executive, and how do we build that personal brand into the broader brand story um, to become a thought leader? I I don't feel that you can be a thought leader without truly tapping into what your personal passion and values are, because just as Brittany just mentioned, you know, if you don't have that at the root, when you're transmitting your points of view, when you are in a room and speaking on a certain topic, you need to be fully versed in what you're going to say. And, and naturally, it should come naturally to you. Um, so I think that that's one of the main things. Um, when thinking about uh, thought leadership overall, uh, from a brand perspective, you touched on Apple, is you always think about who's the person, what's the brand, what's the product, and what's the purpose? Those are your three questions that you should always be asking asking yourself or asking a brand what that wants to embark on a thought leadership platform. Is it, you know, who's the person, who's going to be the face of XYZ item? What's the product? So in Apple's case, you know, they have a specific product that they want to be pushing. And the purpose is to bring innovation and technology and seamless. I'm just threading this to Brittany's purpose, but really thinking that through connectivity and then who that person is to be able to transmit that story of the product and purpose. I love that. Continuing in the Apple vein, I'm sure they would be thrilled to know we're basically acting as brand ambassadors tonight. <laughs> um, but thank you so much, ladies, for kind of giving us this perspective. I'm really interested in, um, and, and I think that this is the na- the next natural kind of step is, what are those best practices that are just tangible every day to day things that could help establish oneself as a thought leader? Whether it's, you know, going back over your LinkedIn with a fine tuned comb, or simply like you mentioned earlier, Brittany, speaking up in meetings, I would love to get some other ones that you think are the absolute essentials. 
I think there's a great opportunity um, for even young professionals to get involved right out of the gate in a thought leadership platform is through your company's blog. Um, that's kind of how I started earlier on in my career is I actually asked my boss up front. I said, hey, I'd love to contribute a few blogs. Are you okay with that? She's like, absolutely. And that was really exciting to me at the time because I had an ability to be able to study my industry, which is the travel and tourism industry at a deeper level that was above and beyond my peers. So I think that that was kind of the first step that I took as a young professional rewind 10 years ago. Um, and to now I'm still writing blogs for the Turner website, you know, 15 years later, I'm still doing that kind of stuff, but also then considering social channels that you're going to be leveraging, you know, are you going to share your professional self through Twitter? Some people do that totally. Okay. Others really rely on LinkedIn and that's a beautiful place to network where you can build new connections. Um, and really follow that journey. And I think that, um, there's there's interesting data within LinkedIn that you're now able to engage with others in, in more dynamic ways through mutual groups. I think that's a great place to become active and engage with conversations and forums. Um, I could go on and on, but I think those are the top two that, I, that I'll share initially and I'll, I'll let Brittany kind of add on. And if there's something that she doesn't cover, I'm happy to jump back in. Noreen, when you said you were a young professional 10 years ago, that was like right out of elementary school. They Look, because right I was about to school. say you might be a professional, but you're still young, okay? <laughs> well, I don't feel young anymore, sadly. <laughs> she got a job right out of elementary school, y'all. I'm going to just leave. I'm going to leave the panel. Um, I think it goes back to those questions that I think Noreen uh, approached, like, said them very well. I had them into the chat. Um, what is your brand? right? Like who, and who, after you get your brand together, who is your customer for the brand? I wasn't, first of all, everywhere I go, I'm trying to tell people what to do about marketing. If they bring something up, I'm like, oh, you could do this, that, and it's like, here are channels you can go down. I was in Vegas. This is a true story at a club in Vegas. And this guy's like, yeah, I run my own plumbing company. I'm like, who's your audience? He's like, who's my audience? Everybody with a toilet. I'm like, no, everybody with a toilet doesn't want you in their house. <laughs> he was like, what if it's an emergency? What if I'm like, no, no, no. If you're just out here putting out ads to anybody with a toilet, you're never going to get customers unless it's the people who know you, right? Like everybody with a, with a toilet doesn't want you in your house. You may not want to travel to the homes of everyone with a toilet. So define your audience. I mean, it's the same thing when you are talking about becoming a thought leader. If you want to become a thought leader in career development or in marketing consulting or in small business consulting or in social media, Find out where your audience spends most of their time. That data is out there. Sometimes it's through the companies that we work for because they're looking at it. See what's available in those resources that are available at your company. See what's available on the World Wide Web of the Internet. And figure out, you know, if I'm going for small business owners between the ages of uh, 35 and, you know, 60, where are they? Do they spend most of their time on Facebook? Uh, if I need to figure out, you know, if I'm trying to show that I am a great you know, fashion design. I want to become a thought leader in fashion design. Do I need to be on Instagram and YouTube or just Instagram, right? So you have to figure out like what it is that you want to do. Again, capitalizing on the passions that you have come to learn about yourself and you come to develop, uh, figuring out where you need to go and who your audience is, and then getting people on board with you. That's really how it starts to go down. Because somebody's in a room and somebody says, you know, Noreen, yes, the one we recruited from elementary school. Well, did you know she took on that blog post? And we had seen before we were only getting three views and now we're getting 12 views. And so she knows not only how to take initiative and to take, you know, to, uh, to, to write. Obviously, she has great communication skills. She also knows how to grow something. Right. So you've got to get people to buy in on what it is that you do. And the only way you can do that is to let people know what you're doing and to find them where they are and find those opportunities where they are. Yeah, I think um, just to build on that too, I think really have a clear understanding of your key industry organizations within the verticals that you work in. Um, I, you know, was very, very specific about getting involved in industry organizations within the travel space that I knew were going to help kind of cement me in the industry. And so really looking at where can I build my network? Where will I have opportunities for speaking down the line? Where can I have 
the ability to learn and continue to grow and really invest my time thoughtfully because there's some people that will just go after every single organization under the sun hoping to network, 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 and that's great. But I think being thoughtful about where you're going to be building your involvement and really have them be organizations that are part of your legacy over the course of your career. You know, I, I joined USTOA 14 years ago. I sit on their board now. Um, you know, I, I was a founding member of MIT. Um, six years ago, I'm not necessarily on the board anymore, but I helped build their Miami chapter when I moved out here. So really continuing to like build that legacy of where you've started and becoming more and more involved as part of the organization. And then that brings additional opportunities for blog, blog con contributions to tour operator sites or their members, um, providing um, opportunities for panels and panel forums, and then just really just opportunities for networking. If you're in a different phase of your career and you want to move to a different company or you want to establish a new area of expertise, you can tap into that knowledge right in your brain trust. I really hope everyone is taking notes because these ladies are dropping gems right now. Um, I'm over here like, Noreen, if you see an email from me tomorrow about writing for the Turner blog, I just, <laughs> it's from this moment right here. Um, so thank you so much for these, um, like, like I said, really tangible actions. I think something else that is really interesting is identifying those thought leadership um, personas that really inspire you. So um, Noreen and Brittany, I'm going to give you the same question, but I'd love for you guys to tackle it from different angles. So Noreen, could you share an example of um, some thought leadership positioning that either you or like Turner as a whole worked on? that you thought was especially successful. And Brittany, could you give an example of a time where um, you were able to successfully position yourself to take advantage of an opportunity that you were very excited about in the thought leadership arena? Uh, feel free to, whichever one of you would love to go first. I'll go ahead and go first. I think for, um, from, my, from my perspective, um, I've been fortunate to only be one, part of one piece of a thought leadership program. I have not seen one start to finish. Um, it's really more about, um, in some cases, I'm the one that's helping train an executive and then they go off and they run their own program on the brand side. So we touch it from a level of strategy and direction. Um, other clients come to us with, this is our thought leader, this is our platform, get us press. And that's where we kind of kick in. So those are kind of the two vacuums that I'm usually working in for thought leadership programs. Um, one of the examples that I'll share that's not related to travel client, I do specialize in travel clients, but I do have one kind of um, exception to the formula, which is a beverage client. And so uh, we work with a company called Tractor Beverage Company, um, which is a farmer founded and farmer owned beverage company that's really revolutionizing the food service space um, and really looking to stomp out um, high sugar content, big soda, um, and offer consumers of, you know, millennials and younger Gen Zer demographic that are really paying attention to what they put into their bodies. And so the first year of our program, we're in year two now, first year was really about, let's get the brand out there. Let's try to help them get generate sales and, and really help them grow. And, you know, in the last 18 months, they've grown up upwards of 300% in revenue and, and they're really, really quickly growing in the market. So now we've pivoted to, we need to be able to storytell. How do we help Tractor be the beverage that people think about what, oh, I want Tractor. They're farmer, they're farmer owned, they're organic, they um, use um, ingredients that are, that, are, that are good for you. And so we have now decided that we're gonna be utilizing Travis, who's the far farmer and founder as a true voice of the brand versus using their CEO or some other business guy that's in a suit. We really wanna be able to tell the story at the core of the brand. And so leveraging um, Travis's personal story, which um, is really touching. Many of his family members were impacted by just drinking big soda and having many genetic diseases as a result. Um, and he was able to kind of mitigate that in his next generation of kids where his children could still enjoy a soda, but not be impacted by sugar um, or have other illnesses that come with it. Um, and so really having him tell his story on how he decided to just make this beverage company at first for just his kids, 
which was what led that brand. And so now we're finally getting to a point where, you know, he's leading the charge on sustainable farming and regenerative agriculture, which is a hot topic. And he has been doing that since day one, since that company has been founded. And so in connecting him to that platform of regenerative farming and better for you beverages is perfect. Like we don't have to work hard to coach him because it's in his DNA from day one. And Noreen, I think you, before we toss it over to you, Brittany, I think you touched on a really critical point um, when you gave that example, which is really staying true to your authentic story, your authentic message, even if it isn't the most buzzy topic at the moment, because oftentimes just because it's not buzzy in that moment doesn't mean it's not going to blow up in 2022 or 2023. And then if you've been putting in the work consistently, you're, that's how you generate a viral moment. That's how you generate a mass um, exposure moment. It's not by hopping on something at the last minute, but it's like, like you mentioned, steadily building that infrastructure so that when that moment comes along, you are 100% prepared to take advantage of that. So that was just something I really wanted to highlight because that was a big takeaway for me. And uh, it's Noreen with the, uh, with the growth data for me, live in action, talking about her story. <laughs> That's, but that's a great example live of thought leadership, right? I, the, the, the way that you like for me to uh, approach the question is like how I found areas to um, grow as a thought leader in the space that I'm in. You look for where everyone else is not running towards, right? You're in these organizations. I work for American Express. It's, you know, it's like the uncle, the divorced uncle who shows up with the Gucci butt on because he got the money, but he don't know what else to do with himself. And so he's trying to be cool and trying to maintain his age as well. And so uh, we struggle with a lot because people will come in and think, oh, this is a new, you know, we've got this fresh little commercial out. We're a fun and funky company. And we're, we still have very old ideals. No, I, I like working there, but you know, I'm just giving you this example. And so because that structure still exists, a lot of people will try to figure out, you know, they'll look at the goals that the VP and that VP sets out and they'll identify what their leaders want. And then they will all just try to please the leader instead of, as Noreen said, figuring out what, what is their pat, what their passions are, what they're good at, identifying them for themselves and by getting the buy-in of their leaders, you know, of course, also while feeding into the larger initiatives as well, but everyone just runs to what's going to impress the, the, the leader in charge. And so when you find those, it, the way I went about it was I knew that I had, I, when I first started American Express, I was an analyst and everyone was talking about what was happening in the digital applications, but nobody had any data. There was a system that held the data, but everyone was just like, I feel that people aren't responding to this message. I feel that people aren't responding to this benefit. And so I went to, to the program and I learned the program. I asked around for the product owner of that program and says, and I asked him like, how do you work this? Can I sit down with you? Can I learn it? And once I learned it, then I created a report inside of the program. Nobody else was working with that program like that. Everybody else was just able to throw out buzzwords and great ideas and impress their leaders that way. And we didn't know what was working, what wasn't working, what should stick around, what should go, because we weren't looking at the data. And so when I learned that program, I built out a report and then I just started shipping it everywhere. I would send out weekly emails and I was unsure about how to go about writing these emails. You know, I literally YouTube and Google like how to write data emails <laughs> because I have a communications background. And I was just like, okay, well, I can say all this, but I'm going to be wordy because, you know, my degree is in journalism. So how do I do it in a way that people can understand? And I learned to, to get better as I just did it. So my first email that I sent out, I'm like, hey, this week we're down 10% in app starts, um, and, but up 5% in app completions because the app starts were low, but in the app completions stayed the same. Like they stayed steady week over week. And everybody was like, oh my goodness, this exists? Like what? And next thing you know, to this day, everybody's like, you have a, a Adobe Omnitrix question? Go to Brittany. I'm like, uh-uh, no. Like, no. And I just recently um, onboarded an analyst myself, and I have taught her the program, and I've given her the reins to now become the thought leader in that space. So it's about finding those empty spaces, finding the area on the playing field that nobody is paying attention to. And if that area aligns with your passions, or if it doesn't necessarily align with your passions, but you can identify ways your passions can enhance that area, that's a surefire way to get up in there and really start to identify yourself on the team and differentiate yourself from what everyone else tries to do. 
Um, Thank you, Brittany. Brittany, I love that you, sorry, Dan, I'm going to jump in really quick. I love that you brought up that idea, that, that concept of passing it along to the new analyst, um, because I did have, you know, in our, what are some of the best practices? I think that's one of the best practices and the signs of a good thought leader is being willing to coach others along with you, um, because you want people to be able to continue growing and, and kind of allowing your, your passion point and your platform to continue to spread farther. And so bringing people in, into the fold is super important. So great job. On Thank you. Thank you, Noreen. And I love the, I love the back and forth kudos here. It's always great to see like, not to sound cliche, Clearly but we're best friends. supporting women. Yeah. <laughs> right. So like, what are we meeting for cocktails next week, ladies? Um, everyone on the panel, of I mean, everyone on the call, of course, invited, but I did want to also call out one thing about what Brittany said that I thought was very relevant as well, was just this idea of internal thought leadership, becoming a thought leader within your corporation and your company. And being that go-to person is very critical once you look to what Noreen talked about, which is the external positioning, um, but you really can't have one without the other. So I love the fact that we have this dual-sided view of like what it goes into being a thought leader. And if I can just add to that. Of course. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I, you mentioned that it was internal. And such a great point that you made externally, if you're thinking about it, there are entrepreneurs on the call. Study your market. Study the people in your market. Study the people in your market who address the audience that you're going for. Study what they're doing. Understand who they're talking to and figure out if y'all are talking to the same people. Because if so, how will you differentiate the brand or the service or whatever it is that you're selling? How would it, you know, there's a ton of people who are speakers. I just myself decided this year that I want to do more speaking engagements. There are plenty of people who speak, but nobody can speak like me. So there's so many people who are doing amazing things and then the amazing things that you know how to do can differentiate yourself, your brand, your business in the market that you occupy. So it's all about doing the research and figuring out where it is that you can infiltrate your passions, your ideas and your thoughts and your products and service and put it in a way that only you can give it. Thank you, Brittany. That was a perfect plug in. And please feel free to interrupt me at any time because you two are the experts, not me. Um, and on that note, I would love to toss it to the larger audience as a whole. Does anyone have any questions for these two lovely ladies? I know I have a million more questions and can continue talking, but definitely want to open up the floor to those of you on the call who might have some more specific questions. And feel free to either come off mute or drop it in the chat. I know I just maybe caught you guys all off guard. So I'll ask one more to give everyone a kind of a chance to get themselves camera ready, just kidding, or typing ready. Um, so ladies, I think another great thing to kind of touch on would be how exactly do you think thought leadership, um, whether it's external or internal, plays a role in um, furthering one's professional development or status within their uh, company. Noreen gave me the you go first eyes. I think I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm actually, I'm going to, I think it's, it's been what we um, have been like kind of driving home throughout the course of this conversation. It's about what, it, what, what unique skills, what unique values, what unique things. There's this activity, this brand activity, right? Where it says like five things, like a four boxes in a circle in the middle. It's like five things I'm passionate about. Um, five things, you know, I love. Five things that mean the most to me and things of that nature. And then you put all, pick words from each of those and that's how, that's how you create your brand story. And then from there you go ahead and develop, you know, what it is you like to become a thought leader in based on those things. But it's really just about defining you and who you are and then defining a space that you want to occupy. You know, you think about the many areas that you can do that in, you know, you don't just have to be a thought leader and, you know, like I didn't just want to be the thought leader in data. So now I've become the thought leader in career coaching in my company as well, I've become the thought leader in product project management, product management is because when those opportunities come up, either someone threw my name in the hat or I threw my name in the hat. And I really just push myself to grow. That's how, that's how you, be, you know, 
I can be a thought leader today. And if I don't do any research and, and don't, you know, don't seek to grow in any way, then I'm not going to be a thought leader for much longer in like this space of like developing your brand. So it's really just about staying current, staying true um, and, and going for those opportunities. I hope I answered the question. I feel like I got a little off track. Um, I think, um, and I guess some key skills that come to play through building thought leadership, um, I guess, in terms of professional development, I think one great thing that thought leadership does is that it helps develop your strategic thinking. Brittany touched on this, like it's thought leadership forces you to learn, learn, and then learn again. And then when you think you know it, you still don't know it and you need to stay on top of it. So I think that helps really shape your strategic thinking overall, um, also helps um, kind of develop your public speaking if you are on a, on a speaking platform or speaking circuit um, really gets you comfortable early on to voice your opinions um, and that translates to your day-to-day -day job right from from a career standpoint working with teams and being able to communicate what an idea is and bring that to fruition I think all of that translates very beautifully into your day-to-day -day work um, and I think the other thing too is that it also helps you learn to challenge the status quo. You know, everybody wants to be safe and, and comfortable, but a good leader is willing to challenge the status quo, be it with solutions. You should never just challenge it to challenge it. Um, a good leader will come up with creative solutions. And I think that being, you know, somebody that's aware of your personal brand has a thought leadership avenue, can challenge those tough questions and answer them and come up with different solutions to entertain. Thank you, ladies. I think we've got an audience question here. Um, I apologize for butchering your name because I know I did. Um, but Thieveline uh, asked, can you tell us about some pivotal moments you felt shaped your personal brand? For instance, risks you might have taken or people you've connected with or projects that you spearheaded. It's a you go first eye for me. You going, Noreen? <laughs> uh, you go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't know how I've now studied your face well enough to know when I'm ready to go. Um, uh, a pivotal moment uh, that shaped my professional brand. You know what? I was trying to define in my first couple of jobs like who I wanted to be, right? Like I'm, I, and, and it was one thing, it's funny because I was talking to a friend about this who we went out to dinner the other day. And I was doing the same thing with everything really in, in my personal relationships and my professional relationships. I was very in a very presenting mode, like, oh, I work here and this is the this is the thing that's happening here. So let me adjust to this. Um, oh, I work here and this is what's happening here. Let me adjust to this. And finally, by the time I started at American Express, I had come off of a job where previously, just previously, where I was exhausted every day because I was trying to present myself as someone that my true self was in complete conflict with. And it was the first day at American Express where I left that for the day and I said to myself, I will only operate as myself moving forward. And wherever that takes me is wherever that will take me, but I can't present and I can't be anything other than myself anymore. Um, that changed everything for me. I have to say that changed everything for me. Showing up with myself changed everything for me. Um, not pretending to be someone else or not presenting myself as someone that I think someone else will want me to be, just being me and being unashamed to be wrong when I'm wrong. I've called out leaders in meetings several times where I'm like, I don't think that's a good way to go about it. We can do this. And the leaders are looking like, what? And sometimes I look like that Diddy mean, like, and I know sometimes I've been nervous, but it's, it's really, it's, it's operating authentically as myself. It's not allowing the fears and judgments of other people to determine my path. And it's taking risk. It's moving and operating through fear, uh, through those moments that are unfamiliar. You know, I don't have parents who are in corporate jobs and everything I do, my mom's a teacher, everything I do, she's like, that might be a little too much. You might be asking for a little too much. That might be, I'm like, okay, I had to learn to be like, all right, sis, you're not over here. So I've got to learn to just move through those, uh, you know, move through that conditioning and, and break out of the conditioning that we've all, that's all been placed on us, particularly as people of color, of what we can and can't do, who we can and can't be, moving past that, moving through fear and, and, and being committed to growth. 
I, I can't pinpoint one exact moment um, in my in shaping my career. There's kind of three main points. Uh, one was I, I chose to start my career working overseas. I was working at Fleischmann Hillard in, in Japan, uh, where I was the minority. I was a foreigner. And on top of that, I didn't speak Japanese yet. And so I think that knowing the moments always, as, as Brittany shared, you know, always having the, the long view in mind for me is what's kind of helped carve the path toward uh, my my building my per professional brand and my personal brand overall is you don't want to stay stagnant. You always need to be looking forward and you always need to be thinking about what's that next thing. And so, you know, I got to a point in Japan where I was like, okay, I need to come back to the States and build my career here. And I did just that. Right. And so um, then I started working at my previous agency. Um, I was with them for almost seven years and got a new challenge that I couldn't turn around, turn, turn away, which was to set up our office out here in Miami and build the team here. And so really always networking and connecting those moments and knowing that moment where it's either I need to level up and ask for more. And if your current employer or if your current whatever your initiative is or whatever you're working on professionally, you feel is going to hamper you from moving to that next level where you personally want to be that's where you need to like innovate or find something that's going to help catapult you even further um, and I think that I've, I've been good and I, I'm fortunate to have been to have predicted those moments in my career to keep me moving forward um, and so now I'm to the point obviously where where I am active and I'm also now coaching other team members to build a thought leadership platform and and be excited about what they're really good at because I think that what you're strong at is what's going to help build your professional brand and help you sense those pivotal moments in your career. I love that because I think Noreen, you're um, coming from like a wealth of experience that Brittany and I are just kind of like leveling up to, uh, but hearing that commonality, like that need to be able to recognize those moments. Like Brittany, when you were talking about taking on an executive in a meeting, because you knew that that was a moment in which you had a chance to level yourself up. Um, I love this feeling that you ladies both had that surety within yourselves because I think that's something that's very critical as we all battle imposter syndrome. Um, that's something that many people of color really struggle with. And I know uh, speaking to a variety of young professionals, that's something they struggle with. So just hearing that you had that surety is very inspiring. And I think- yeah, with Go ahead, Brittany. Sorry, with, with imposter syndrome, you gotta know any door you make it in, you were supposed to be there. Whether it's for an hour, two hours, six years, 60 years, wherever the case may be. It's all conditioning. The fact that you, no one's born, like you weren't born and said to the doctor, well, where the hell, what the hell, who the hell, where the hell I come from? Like, what the hell is this about? You know, no one got like, what the hell, I could be in a hospital? You mean I can be in a hospital by naked? Nobody comes out questioning where, where and why they should be should or should not be where they are. Nobody does that. That's conditioning. So when those moments come up where you say to yourself, oh, I feel like I'm not going to, I shouldn't be here. I feel like I don't have the expertise. I feel like I didn't have the, the you know, the foundation in my family to, to do this. Those are, those are not your thoughts. Those are somebody else's thoughts. And unless you want to take on somebody else's thoughts, it takes, to me, I, you, I like analogies. I like putting things into real life perspective. For me to allow a thought that someone has told me about myself that is negative, for me to take that on and build that out is like if somebody, if you walk out the door and your neighbor from two blocks over that you barely speak to is like, oh, I hate that outfit. Go take that outfit off. I bought you a new one. Go put it on. And you go in the house and put it on. You don't even know the neighbor. You don't even, you barely see him. Why would you go put the outfit on that he told you to wear? Like, that's how I have to think about it. Like, you really want to go out here with some thoughts that's not even yours. Like, and so we're, don't, the imposter syndrome, like, and then see, they've made, people have made brands around it, right? It's become the, the thing. So when that happens, it becomes even more of a thing that takes over your brain. It's not real. It's not real. And it's not true. You belong at every door you enter. That was... I can't even follow that up. I see the clap hands from Kimja. <laughs> thank you. Um, Kevin, thank you so much for dropping a question and you're welcome to take yourself off mute or I can read it for you. I don't wanna. Okay, I can just read it for you. With the online social media marketing of your brand business, um, 
where the market is really saturated with so many influencers, how do you show authenticity and allow customers to trust you by your product? Um, he mentions in-person testimonials. Um, I imagine online reviews would be similar. Uh, I think this is a question that would be great for you all to kind of touch on. I'm curious, Kevin, what industry do you work in? Hey, uh, education and literacy. Okay. What's the product that you're trying to um, sell? More on the financial Kevin. literacy side. So things that would be marketed by Dave Ramsey or Anthony O'Neill and a lot of uh, other influencers that are in that financial literacy space. Okay, is it books or is it, is it a service, an app? Or it's okay that hasn't been decided yet either. Just products, just products, just materials. Okay. I think that, and, and Noreen touched on this earlier with the um, founder of Tractor, right? Like the only way you can show up authentically is to show up authentically. Like what is it about your products <laughs> that makes it different from anybody else's products? Why should I buy Kevin's book? Dave Ramsey has, I think about, at this point, 60,000 books. So why should I buy a Kevin book over a Dave Ramsey book? Who is it that you're talking to? How, what is the language inside of the book that will speak to me, speak to your audience? And you don't necessarily have to come up and have your first online presence be someone in a video saying, I love Kevin's book. He taught me everything I know. This is amazing. No, it doesn't have to be like that. And you don't necessarily have to get influencers, big name influencers, to do the work that you need to do. Right before this call, I just sent a colleague of mine a video of a black woman who has a, a, about, I think, I think 7,000 followers, and she had an American Express card. And she was big enough American Express just because she wanted to give the information about business credit versus personal credit. I'm like, these are the people we should get to be representing our brand. And so, but it doesn't necessarily have to be anyone with a big following. It could be you just coming online and saying, you know, your first post, here's, my, here's the products that I offer. Or instead, Throughout your post, you build a story. Financial literacy is, you know, a, a crippling topic in communities of color. Post number one, boom, on a bright a background. If your colors are bright, whatever your brand colors are, your brand emotions and moods are, should match with the colors that you use. The second post tells another part of that story. The third post, the fourth post. And then finally, you do a reveal. You know, you have to reveal up in your stories. You have to reveal up with your you know, whatever uh, networks that you're in, and then you reveal whatever product you're selling. Uh, you probably need to be on LinkedIn too, because there are people who work, who have 401ks, who have money sitting around that they need to know what to do with. Using LinkedIn as a tool, using YouTube as a tool, going on there, showing your brand face. You know, people would love to see the owner behind the brand, knowing that it's black owned, that that's an important part of your brand for you. Uh, so there's many other ways to go about getting your brand out there and getting people to trust you. Um, but, but also like you, it all comes with defining your audience. You got to know who your audience is. Like there are people who buy, uh, slim tea just to buy slim tea. They don't, they probably don't even drink it. They just buy it because Meg Thee Stallion had it up. Meg Thee Stallion's not even talking to them. They just like, oh, she got it on her picture. I'm going to get, I'm going to get some slim tea and don't even need it. So who do you want to talk to? Do you want people who just interact with your content or do you want them people who interact with your content and buy your product or buy your products but don't interact with your content? It's all about defining who it is that you want to uh, talk to and then approaching the um, approaching your market that way. And, and being super clear about what, your, what solution or what solve you're providing through your business. So your key selling proposition is what's super important, but you don't also don't want to do it in a super salesy way because that's going to turn people off. So I think that being wise about how you position your, your proposition, um, I love the kind of teasing it through an Instagram or through a blog or your website. I think Instagram is probably like if you want to put posting dollars and try to get new audiences, I think that's probably a better approach. Um, but really thinking through like what's your message, what are you solving, and why do people need to um, utilize your product now? Those are both, um, I think those are both, um, what is, can you guys hear me? Sorry, I'm getting like a weird note. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yes, I think those are both really great points. And um, I would love to chime in here too, if you don't mind, Kevin. Um, you mentioned being concerned about other influencers and the market. 
you don't need to worry about other influencers. That's not why you got into this. You got into this because you believe that you had something special, something specific, something to say that those other people are not saying. So like our lovely ladies mentioned earlier, hone in on your authenticity, hone in on your message, focus on that. And don't worry about your competitors at this growth stage, because right now is really about discovering your brand, learning what that brand is and really making and really honing in on what your key messaging, your key niches within this market, as you do have other competitors, like focus on yourself, focus on that authenticity to really promote yourself to this thought leadership level is what I would say as someone who's worked with a, a lot of other smaller brands um, who, are, who are interested in breaking into like a larger, more oversaturated field. You can't worry about the people with 60,000 followers. You can only worry about the people who have 6,000 followers because those are your direct competition. So like what makes you different? What makes you special? And with that note, um, I think we are at time. So I would love to thank these ladies for lending their voices, lending their insight to us tonight. It has been a magical conversation. I'm coming away with so much and I hope, I know I'm speaking on behalf of the entire audience when I say that. Um, so thank you so much. And um, I'm gonna toss it back to Lakimja to really close out the evening. Thank you, Deandra, you were excellent. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. Can you join me in giving it up and clapping and you know so many gems so many gems were shared this evening in tonight's conversation challenge the status quo but don't just challenge it bring your solutions make sure you're bringing your authentic self and don't be scared to take on stretch goals where you can be seen as a thought leader and know your superpower and leverage it just to name a few um thank thank you deandra for the amazing moderation 